Hello there, and welcome to another episode of Taking the Stand, a Freedom Advocacy Network podcast production. Um, a broadcast every Thursday uh, at six o'clock on the platform where you are now on YouTube or Facebook or some such place. I mean, primarily go to YouTube. It's there. It's all there. Don't worry about it. Uh, but on other things as well, I'm sure you can find it if, if you know, someone with the proper patience to actually you know, do their job in this regard, which present this thing. But just let's let's just assume I had a brilliant intro and let's get into the substance of what we're chatting about today, where we are continuing our rule of law discussion. Um, essentially, uh, we, are, we are working our way through um, the definition of the rule of law, the manifestation of the rule of law, as set forward by Lord Bingham who uh, was a big cheese in the uh, British justice system and delivered a lecture, a very, very important lecture about a decade or two ago in which he defined what he considered the rule of law to be. And that then became a very good book, a shortish book, I think about 140 pages setting out um, uh, uh, you know, what the rule of law is, what it looks like. Because too often when we talk about the rule of law, it can be something very abstract something very airy fairy and and you know it, 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 in a time like now in a country like south africa the conversation about what the rule of law is needs to go beyond the fuzzy the you know fudged ideas of intellectuals and and really we must try to extract what it means in reality and as ever i am joined by ben uh, of uh, who is my colleague at the Fan Justice Project, where we fight for your freedom because you know it, your freedom is worth fighting for. Um, ben, perhaps uh, if we're going to look at, I think, point number four today, would you give us a quick recap of the first three points uh, that we've been discussing over the last few weeks? For sure. So um, very quickly, the first point uh, is... Um, the law should be clear, um, accessible, and understandable um, for the public to digest and understand it. Um, the second is that we should be governed by law and not by uh, the discretion, uh, sort of rule of law, not rule of man. Um, the third is uh, equality before the law. Everyone is equal before the law. No one is above it, not politicians, not, um, not anyone. No one is superior to the law. So those are the quickly the first three points, and today we're moving on to point four, which is quite a complicated one, um, and it basically says that um, the people um, who administer the law, the administrators, um, need to administer it, um, it in a way that is um, in good faith uh, and reasonable and um, for the purpose for which the law is conferred. Um, and yes, so that's law. That's point number four today. Cool. So I must say this, this is, I think, of the eight points, um, perhaps the most abstract one. Uh, the law must be understandable, quite straightforward. You know, anyone must be able to reasonably understand what the law of the land is or the law under which they must live their lives. Uh, number two, uh, the idea that um, we live, we want to live in a society where the rule of law means that it's not just the whims of the powerful that determine what behavior is okay or not okay. Again, that's quite clear. We, we, we need to understand the system um, is one of a objective application um, and universal application, not just uh, this powerful interest deciding that or that type of behavior is, you know, appropriate or inappropriate. And then the third one is a, a very, very important one. It's, you know, no one is above the law, as you say, but now this fourth one actually is a bit more esoteric, a bit more theoretical um, in the sense that let's, let's digest it a bit. We've got Actually, a few concepts here that I want to stand still at. Um, the first one is ministers and public officials. Um, now, if, if we look at those words alone, we, we, we start to, we need to understand what they mean. Um, public officials, 
Um, broadly, I think, Ben, correct me here if I'm wrong, but I think broadly we can understand a public official to be someone who acts with the authority or the mandate of the state, that it is their duty, they are appointed to exercise some function, not necessarily of government, but of the state broadly. Um, does that strike you as a fair interpretation of public officials? And um, perhaps also give us just perhaps your idea of if, if they say ministers, do they mean the cabinet? What do they mean exactly there? So I think you've hit the nail on the head there. So the broad term for all of these um, people who exercise this power are, are, are sort of administrators. They administer the law. They um, they take it from the from the legislation and they they sort of um, put it into action. Um, and that can go from um, the cabinet, people in the cabinet, um, and a broad range of of of, of other. Um, people with the with these sort of powers so people in the cabinet can sort of sub delegate their power to um to uh you know people below them who act in a public official role and it is incredibly complicated um, anyone who's studied law um at university knows that administration or uh, sorry administrative law is by far the most difficult so um yeah. No, I must say, I, I think that's a very good point to make, because in South Africa, we, we perhaps could quickly stand still at this point, is the, the and, and to return to a point we raised a, a few weeks ago, is the separation of powers, the trias politica, um, is where you've got the people who make the law, that's parliament. You've got the people who apply and administer the law, that's government. And then you've got the people who see whether, number one, the law is made in terms of the correct procedures and whether it's applied in terms of the correct protocols and that's the judiciary. And these three, not, none of these three points of power may dominate the other one. If you find there's some domination here, then you must be very suspicious as to whether the constitutional norm of the rule of law through the separation of powers is actually being adhered to. And on this specific point of administration, the administration of the law, um, in South Africa, all administrative, essentially executive government functions flow through the president. So the president is elected to the national National Assembly, which is the bigger chamber of parliament. Our parliament has two chambers, one of 400 seats and one of 90 seats. The 90 seats is what we call the National Council of Provinces, where the provincial governments and provincial legislatures have their representation at national level. Then we've got the National Assembly. Now, that's the important one. We call it the lower chamber, but it's actually the chamber with the real heft. Um, it's a bit like the House of Commons. If I were to say to you, which one's more important, the House of Lords or the House of Commons, people might think the Lords are the important people, but the Commons actually represent the people. So we've got this weird thing about the lower house actually being the more powerful one, whatever. That's how parliamentary systems work in the Westminster tradition, and we go with it. So the president is elected to the National Assembly, the 400-seat uh, chamber of parliament. When or at that point he or she is not the president, they're just a member of a political party until, of course, the elections change and how people get elected parliament changes. It's no longer a political party, but that's a, a future episode. Um, but this person, Sir Oron Porza, was elected to be um, an MP, a member of parliament for the ANC. Then the National Assembly elects the president. They elected Cyril Ramaphosa to be president, and then he ceased to be a member of parliament. He ceased to be a member of the legislature, and he became the manifestation, the embodiment of executive power, of the administration of law. And then, Ben, as you point out so clearly that You've got the president who is the very embodiment of executive power. He then appoints the cabinet and the cabinet then exercises the administrative executive powers of applying the law and making policy. And then that delegation goes through many ways. For example, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, speed limits, the speed limits in South Africa is actually what one might call a delegated 
capacity because while the president technically is the manifestation of the power to make speed limits, that power is delegated by legislation to the Minister for Transport, and that power is, I think, then further delegated to some other committees that advise the Minister on how it works. So, so it's quite complex. The whole process of administrative law is quite complex. But the thing I want to ask you about, Ben, is perhaps something, a term that our audience might not be familiar with, and that is, or two terms, um, well, actually, one term, two words, ultra-virus. What does that mean to you if we are going to look at this idea of an administrator must act within the scope of their powers? What does it mean when an administrator acts ultra virus? Okay, so ultra virus is a Latin term which means beyond their powers. So the um, legis the legislature will um, produce long, as we say, long uh, list of words and provisions and all of that, which basically um, directs the administrator to act in a certain way. And if a legislate, if an administrator um, goes beyond that or outside of that, then they are seen to be acting ultra virus, which is um, uh, in contravention with our uh, sort of rule of law. Um, mm -hmm. And all these points, again, um, go, go together. So now they're acting with um, discretion. Um, and it's a bit of an abuse of discretion, which is one of the sort of grounds of, of review that we can we can um, we can take um, on on the administrator through uh, the judicial review process. And I think in South Africa we've 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 suffered um, from some significant failures in this regard. I mean, state capture was part and parcel just one big ultra virus action where. Um, uh, administrators, people with government power um, uh, acted not in good faith, often beyond the scope of what they were allowed by law to do, and for purposes other than which the powers were conferred reasonably in the first instance. Do you think that would be a fair, you know, glance is to say that state capture is a failure of the rule of law on point four, on the specific point of the scope and limitation and good faith of administrators and their powers. Yeah. So let so to just um, add a little bit to that, when an when an administrator makes a decision, um, their decision needs to be um, lawful, um, reasonable, rational. Okay. If it's outside of that, it's it's um, seen as um, uh, unlawful and it can go under judicial review. So if an administrator makes a decision that enriches him in some way, that's, that's not the reason he's in power to do that. He can't, that's, that, that, so that can go on review. So, and that's what we see in state capture. We see people making decisions which help them or help their friends and that's, and that's something that they're not allowed to do. That, um, so do you think that's a, that's a good way to put it? Oh yes, no. I, th I think I think it's a, it's an excellent way to put it. And and what what I'm really loving about this series um, is how we are taking the idea of the rule of law and, and really trying to pinpoint its existence in South Africa. We know it should exist, but I must say, um, if an explanation like that sort of makes it clear that all these stories in the media that we've been hearing for a decade now, state capture isn't some sort of uh, anathema concept that that uh, a virus that just escaped from a lab somewhere in China. It is a fundamental systemic failure of the rule of law. When people talk about the rule of law, they don't often think about state capture as a failure of the rule of law. But it's important that this sort of discussion illustrates that state capture wasn't just some appearance. It it became a problem and a reality because the rule of law wasn't adhered to by the South African government. So a quick recap. Point number one is the law should be accessible and intelligible, clear and predictable. <laughs> Problems. South Africa, we're not doing well on that score. COVID the last year really showing how regulations and laws 
Not always accessible, not always intelligible, not always clear or predictable. Number two, um, the, it should be resolved, uh, legal issues should be resolved through the exercise of law, not of discretion. Well, in, again, in South Africa, I mean, you can look at examples of Judge Lope and you can almost go back um, to, to the, the, the um, decision, uh, what was it, uh, Judge Hierfer? I can't exactly remember who who may who essentially laid the groundwork for Jacob Zuma to become president by finding from the judicial bench that his prosecution had been politically motivated. That was not the rule of law really in action there. I think you would find an unhealthy dose of discretion there. Point number three, law should apply equally to all. Now, in re response to that, we only have to mention two things, BEE, blatant elite enrichment, and Jacob Zuma, and we see that equality before the law is not really in good uh, spirits in South Africa. And then our fourth rather depressing episode of today is that if administrators of state power can act outside of the scope of their powers and something like state capture can happen, yeesh, it's zero for four for the rule of law in South Africa now. That doesn't mean we give up on this. In fact, it means the exact opposite. We must now take this challenge up and take it to the next level, like an adolescent couple. We need to get to the next level. We must make sure that we don't just want to the rule of law as a big ethereal concept to exist in South Africa. We must say the next time a law is passed through a provincial legislature or parliament, and the ordinary person cannot understand or read it, we need to take a stand. If we see decisions being made based on discretion, not law, we need to take a stand. If we see laws applying not equally, we need to take a stand. And if we see things like state capture, we cannot just go, ah, oh, Zondo Commission of Inquiry, it'll solve it all. No, we must take a stand and say, the rule of law is something we're fighting for because the rule of law protects freedom. And then, I will give you the opportunity to sign off this week's episode. Why should we fight for the rule of law? Because your freedom is? Your freedom is worth fighting for. Ah, wonderful. See you guys next week. Cheers.